Welcome back to This Week in Creationism, episode number 48. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and we're take a look at some recent headlines in the world of creationism and will wonders never cease, but Ken Ham and Joel Duff have found something to agree upon. But before we get to that, we have to get to the big story of the week, and that is the Institute for Creation Research, and specifically their president, Randy Guliuza, have called out young earth creationists for being Darwinist. This is much in the same vein that Ken Ham is calling out other creationists for being young earth evolutionists. And in a way, I think that I'm, I'm going to show you that I think that Randy Guliuza is actually calling out Ken Ham for being a Darwinist and being a young earth evolutionist. It's getting a little crazy out there. Answers in Genesis has a series going on in young earth evolution and the dangers of that within the world of creationism. And here we're going to see Randy Guliosa really taking his biggest shot yet at problems within young earth creationism, specifically their acceptance of mutations and natural selection as mechanisms for how organisms can adapt and change in the environment. All right, so we have to dig into that recent article, and we'll also look at Ken Ham's um, response to uh, critics of his own series of Young Earth Evolutionist. Let's get after that coming up next. It's truly been a, a, a sight to see among Young Earth creationism over the last month. The series in Young Earth Evolutionist that's going on at Answers in Genesis. Randy Gullios has been talking for a long time about his hmm, dislike for the word natural selection, for his promotion of something he, which he thinks is an alternative explanation for the adaptation of organisms, which he calls continuous environmental tracking. And that sort of set him apart along with Institute for Creation Research, which seems to be fully embracing this alternative young earth creationist approach to understanding biological diversity. And now Randy Guliosa is taking the next step. Um, he's written about it multiple times, but this latest article really seems to say, young earth creationist, you've got it wrong. And he's even gonna say that the Institute for Creation Research historically has had it wrong, and they are taking a new direction, a new step to turn away from what he thinks is Darwinism creeping into young earth creationism. So let's start right there. Let's start with Guliusa talking about continuous environmental tracking and the dangers of mutation and natural selection. All right, so here we go. From the Institute for Creation Research, we've got mutation selection, a calamitous creationist concession. <laughs> That's a pretty bold, uh, pretty bold title here. Let me read a couple sections of this article to you and we'll comment. Creation scientists sometimes say to evolutionists, we have the same data you do, but we have a different interpretation. This is a pretty common Ken Ham saying. The statement is definitely true of different approaches to geology. Interpreting geological features as artifacts of a global year-long flood differs radically from the conventional belief that present geological processes are, part, uh, are the key to understanding the past. All right, so he's saying that we have this, we agree, we have the same data, we see the same layers of, of rock, we see the same fossils in those layers. We just have alternative explanations for how, well, we have alternative explanations for that particular data. But now he's gonna contrast that with the creationist view of biology. But it isn't true that creationists have historically interpreted biological adaptation differently than Darwinists. He's saying that, you know, creationists have actually used the same explanations as Darwinists. We've almost always assented to the Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection. Sure, we've tacked on a few disclaimers that while mutation selection is true, it's limited. In other words, we allow that mutations do happen. We allow that natural selection happens. We simply say that, that those are mechanisms that might cause organisms within a kind to change, like even maybe even make new species. So, and it allows organisms to adapt to their environments. But we say it's limited, right? We say that kinds can't make new kinds. They can only change within kinds. But sure enough, within kinds, we're accepting the mutation selection sort of paradigm. We've added more disclaimers to force fit it into a biblically inconsistent explanation. So here he comes right out saying, that's actually a biblically inconsistent explanation. This jury rigging of our explanation should be a wake up call that we're way off base. 
the fact that creationists have been playing Darwin's game on his field by his rules. For instance, when it comes to the extraordinary biological changes that are observed in beak finches, flightless birds on islands, peppered moths, creation scientists have historically failed to provide a biblically consistent and scientifically sensible alternative explanation for them. He's saying, we don't really have a different paradigm. We've basically been trying to fit our explanation into a Darwinist explanation. Things like super rapid hyperspeciation or uh, extra fast natural selection, or uh, although usually they're not going to invoke uh, extra mutations. Uh, we haven't even generated a new hypothesis. <laughs> this is uh, kind of, I, I don't know if this is refreshing to hear a young earth creationist this or, or a little bit disturbing that um, they're recognizing that they haven't even come up with a new hypothesis an alternative hypothesis uh, to Darwin's ideas. For decades, we've interpreted things like the loss of eyes in cave fish by applying the same ill-conceived, scientifically foolish narrative, gloss, uh, uh, gloss of random genetic mutations that are mystically acted on by Darwin's concept of natural selection. Now, if you've read Gullius or have heard me talk about it before or others, uh, he likes to talk, talk about how natural selection is a mystic force and is not a real thing, right? It's a, it's a made-up phenomena. Uh, so, and then he's emphasizing here, too, the word random, right? He doesn't believe there's any such thing as random genetic mutations, and he doesn't believe that natural selection exists as a, as a force, although I don't like the word force uh, either. Somehow, we've believed that we could tack on something like but all Darwin shows is a loss of eyes. In other words, a loss of information. You know what he's doing here? He's using a lot, a lot of Ken Ham's words, right? Yeah, Ken Ham says that that's just a loss of information. Ken Ham shows like a wolf becoming a chihuahua and says that that's a loss of information, right? They're losing parts. Um, so, He's using Ken Ham and, say, Nathaniel Jeanson and other people, at, at, at folks at Answers in Genesis. He's using their language, and he's saying that that's a tack-on. He's calling that foolish narrative and not the evolution of eyes, and thus conform our thinking wholly to the Darwinian mechanism while fortuitously, fortuitously escaping the anti-theist effects in its thinking. Right? He's going to claim that what they're doing is anti-theist. It's going to He's saying Ken Ham is an anti-theist right here. But we haven't escaped. By playing Darwin's game, we've compromised biblical truth and impeded scientific research. We can't refute the Darwinian explanation of adaptive change because we're saying the same thing. Wow, this is quite this is a heck of a first three paragraphs. I'm going to scroll up here really quick and I'm going to read you the article highlights because that'll give you the big overview. And then I'm going to skip some sections and we'll, we'll hit the, the big stuff. Um, and I know you probably can't read this on your screens, but uh, the article highlights are creation biologists have traditionally accepted some form of mutation selection in their models. That's, that's point number one. Followed by this is a fundamental error. Because accepting mutation selection means accepting an anti-design explanation for life. He views this as fundamentally anti-design. And the reason he believes that because he's saying you're invoking mutations, you're invoking randomness, and you're invoking a process of natural selection, which is, which is taking individuals out of a, out of a pool um, and selecting certain things and it's and for him again it's a mystical force right a mystical force is selecting some individuals and not others i think he's viewing that also as a semi-random sort of application which doesn't make sense natural selection really isn't a random process but nonetheless this mystical force right that's not a theistic explanation because it doesn't invoke a designer a creator or somebody that's in control or in charge of this process so it, to his, in his mind, this is just atheistic. Uh, you know, we're just falling completely for the atheistic model here of there is no controller, there is no designer, there is no God. Mutation selection implies a process without purpose, 
a random sequence of events. I guess I could have just read that instead of explained it to you since you just said it. Jesus Christ uh, engineered, remember he has an engineering background, engineered every living thing with precise purpose. Therefore, genetic selection is specifically directed and designed. So he's saying God designed natural selection and he directs natural selection, even though it says natural selection is not a real thing. When he wants to use the word natural selection in his own way, it is something that is designed and specifically directed. So God is, has design mechanisms within an organism that choose the, or, the features that a specific individual has rather than a environment selecting individuals in a population. It's somehow from within that organisms themselves decide who's going to survive and who's not and who's, how they're going to adapt uh, as individuals. In, in, a, in, a lar in a large sense, this is very much tracking along sort of the Lamarckian uh, evolution uh, pattern, uh, the Lamarckian evolution ideas of the 1800s. ICRs, Continuous Environmental Tracking, CET, their model of adaption is engineering-based and organism-focused, right, instead of environmental-focused. And it sees genetic sequences as being purposefully designed to solve specific environmental challenges. So each organism has in it a pre-programmed set of uh, 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 a set of programs that are there such that an environmental tra if the environment changes, it triggers a program which then responds to that environment. The, once again, individuals are responding and changing their genetic makeup or at least the expression of their genes due to the environment. Creation scientists have an opportunity to provide a design explanation for biological change that honors our creator. This is a fundamentally different approach and model to the Answers in Genesis or Creation Ministries International approach, and honestly, to almost all other creationists. Now, Randy Gooley is a, just recently was um, part of a, a what was it, Genesis conference 2023. I just watched uh, one of his videos where he basically says all of this, and then it comes out on the website. So I think it was all kind of planned together. And who he's speaking with is David uh, Reeves or Rives, um, who's a uh, also an independent uh, creationist, and Dan Biddle, who has his own creation website. Uh, and this was a big conference, and that's who ICR is kind of like working together with. These that that shows that how far out of the mainstream ICR has become now. And they're essentially isolated from the rest of the creationist organizations, I think mostly because of the stance he's taken here about how biological change happens. And he's taking a completely contrasting view. And to this point, he's, he's argued these points in a variety of different ways. And even in the Young Earth creationist literature, uh, more the peer-reviewed literature. But I believe that this is the strongest like I, I think he's kind of saying, this is it. We're 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 going this direction, and uh, rather than working to figure out our differences, we're just going to say we're different, and we're even going to call you out and say that you need to reform your ways. Right? You're being a Darwinist, and we're the ones that aren't the Darwinist. This is all very fascinating because of Ken Ham's uh, calling out other young Earth creationists for being young Earth evolutionist. All right. Then he's got a section about how, well, evolution is just trending toward atheism. So this is just more of his diatribe about how if you accept mutations and natural selection, you're just you're down, you're going down the slippery slope toward atheism. And answers in Genesis accepts at least some some form of mutation, but definitely natural selection as a mechanism for adapting organisms in, in the present world. Uh, purposeless muta mutations. All right. That's a segue to anti-design thinking. How can you have design with random mutations? I mean, isn't that just, you know, he's, he's like flabbergasted that intelligent design uh, would, intelligent design folks would accept some of these things about mutations when they're fundamentally, in his mind, random and therefore against design, even though it's supposed to be an intelligent design. Um, and so he, he has a section about that. We don't really need to look at that. Um, I'll just say the vast majority of evolutionary biologists would adamantly maintain that genetic changes are undeniably purposeless. Right? 
Now maybe the fundamental change is at the, at the level of where the mutation happens, the initial mutation. But what happens to that mutation is not, not at all random, right, with respect to natural selection. But let's, you know, undirected mistakes. Let's, let's not go too far into that. They cannot comprehend or countenance bio biology operating in any other way. Now, Randy Gugliosa has the other way, right? He's going to explain how biology really happens from this engineering perspective. Um, but let's continue and see how, how much he thinks that creation scientists have gone astray. How far have they gone down the slippery slope? A long way, according to uh, Gugliosa. Regrettably, most creationist and intelligent design advocates also couldn't fathom biological adaption happening in any other way themselves. So we publicly endorse so we publicly endorse the Darwinian mechanism of randomly occurring broken genes that are worked on by Darwin's concept of natural selection. Right? Random mutations happen, and then natural selection works on those mutations to determine which ones are useful and which ones aren't useful. Uh, eliminating them from the population. But he calls that, i.e., passive creatures being shaped by selection pressures. Passive creatures, oh, these mutations have to be, and then the world determines what's going to happen with those. He wants to put the organism at the center of making its own decisions. Um, this Lamarckian thing. A prime illustration is the exhibit describing the origin of cavefish displayed in the ICR's original creation museum in Santee, California. Okay, so back ICR, by the way, is, is, is a home in um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area in Texas now. But originally they started in Santee, California, Southern California. And they had a creation museum there. That's, that's the, really the original creation museum. Uh, and this is back when Ken Ham uh, started and came from uh, Australia. He came to Southern California to work for ICR and be an apologist uh, with them. And so during that time, they had this creation museum, and this is this is really amazing. Randy Gugliosa is pointing out. Now, I, I mean, I admire him for trying to make changes and being willing to make this, you know, being will, being willing to admit error uh, in the past in his own organization. But he's saying our own creation museum had this explanation for the origin of cavefish, and he's going to say we were completely wrong. We were completely wrong. We we misinformed. The public. Let's read that illustration, all right? That explanation. As genetic information is copied and passed on generation after generation, occasionally there are copying mistakes known as mutations. It's all good there. Mutations have been observed to destroy, damage, or corrupt genetic information or to be neutral, but have never been observed to add new information. Okay, I mean, they continue to make that mistake saying that it never adds new information, but um, this is even this is true even of so-called beneficial mutations that might be advantageous to the surviving organism in some circumstances. This is the typical like way to get around beneficial mutations to say that was beneficial, but only in that particular environment. So it's not truly beneficial because it had to be beneficial to all organisms everywhere, which is a stupid idea because no mutation is ever beneficial. There is no characteristic that an organism has that is beneficial in every possible environment. I'm sorry, I have features that if I were in outer space would not benefit me at all and they would not be positive mutations. Uh, that's an extreme example, but every organism, it's relative to the environment. When a mutation occurs in a light environment that causes animals' offspring not to have eyes, it's an enormous disadvantage. So natural selection eliminates this flaw. That's pretty easy to see. When the eyeless defect occurs here in a cave, it does not give any disadvantage and so is not eliminated. In fact, it may give advantages. Those with eyes can crash into things, injuring the eyes, and can get diseases of the eyes, possibly leading to death. I would also say it requires energy to try to see, a lot of energy to try to see. The, so that would be the best explanation for why there's a positive benefit to not having eyes or functioning eyes in the dark. Eventually, selection pressure ensures that all are eyeless. Selection pressure, so the environment, the black cave, is the thing that selects individual fish that can't see as 
living preferentially to those who can see, right? So for my, in my example, if you're able to see, you're using a lot of energy to see, except you're not really able to see. The ones that aren't doing that can use that energy for reproduction and therefore have more offspring. So therefore they're gonna be represented, overrepresented in the next generation. These ghostly fish are prime examples of how mutation and natural selection lead to a reduction of, fu of functioning systems. These adaptations, because it is an adaptation, you're adapting to a dark environment versus the white light environment you're in, are no evidence at all for the belief that complexity has risen by such processes. They only show how information can be lost in a fallen world. So this is the typical creation science lingo, right? Yes, there is mutations, there is natural selection, and organisms are adapting to environments via natural selection, but that can only go so far, and they like to call it a loss of information, so you're not actually gaining information. Um, all right, that is something you would see written over and over and over again in creation science literature all over the place, all the way to the present, even though this was from 25 years ago. In sum, Creationists also claim that surface-dwelling ancestors gradually morphed into cave-dwelling forms due to genetic, random genetic mutations that result in loss of information through a purposeless trial and error process of death and survival, <laughs> natural selection, that produces depigmentation and blindness. Selection pressures ensure that all are eyeless. Right? You're probably wondering, like, what's he, what does he find wrong with this? I understand he's trying to say, whoa, this is death in survival and natural selection is doing this, but I mean, this is, uh, you know, how do you imagine this being any, any different? Seems like a rational explanation for uh, a reasonable explanation based on what we observe. Nonetheless, he's trying to say this is all wrong. What's usually missed is that both the non-evolutionary and evolutionary interpretations are identical. Well, in fact, they're close to identical. I mean, they're, they're I mean, that, the explanation for why cave fish are white and they lack eyes they, is essentially is identical. I would say that the speed at which that happens, they might, might disagree upon. Both invoke the mutation selection mechanism. Two problems arise. So what are these problems? First, creationists use the same words and thoughts, conveying the anti-design assumptions pivotal to evolutionary theory. They don't like to have to use the word uh, random. All right, because that sounds like anti-theism. It's anti-design to use the word random, so we shouldn't be using it. This is very similar to the arguments that have been recently made in Answers in Genesis for what's wrong with the young earth evolution. They're using the word evolution. And since the average person in the pew hears the word evolution and thinks molecules to man, um, this is causing cognitive dissonance among their listeners. You know, they don't understand the nuances of different forms of evolution and different processes, and some we can accept as being part of how God works in this world in kinds, and some processes aren't. But because the typical person can't understand that, we shouldn't be using those words. This is like, this is very confusing, right? That's very similar to here. Creationists use the same words as evolutionists. Right, and so therefore we shouldn't be using those words. Stop using natural selection, stop using mutation because those have connotations that are understood by evolutionary biologists that we disagree with, and therefore we can't use those words. I mean, make up some different words, I guess. And this may shake acts and facts readers to the core, <laughs> okay? That's their newsletter. And this article will be in that newsletter. Essentially, every assertion of our old ex explanation has been shown to be scientifically untrue. Let's read that again. Hmm. Essentially, every assertion in our old explanation, the one I just read above that was at the Creation Museum in Santee, has been shown to be scientifically untrue. Wow. So what is the truth? Consider another example of two statements describing how biological adaptation occurs. One is made by the vehemently anti-design atheist Massimo Pigalucci. The other was published in a creationist journal reflecting what I thoughtlessly repeated for years. Which one is Pigalucci's? Little tangent here. Um, Massimo Pigalucci. I was a member of the search committee at the University of Tennessee that uh, gave Massimo Pagliucci his first job as an assistant professor. 
I was actually a graduate student at the time, but there was a, a graduate student representative on faculty searches. I don't think it's probably unheard of today. Um, but great experience for me to actually be on a job search uh, and, and see all the candidates, have my own, get to have my own interview with all the candidates. I have very, I, I mean, I don't remember anyone else who applied to that job. Um, and of course, I remember Pigalucci, not because he got the job, um, but uh, let's just say he's a very confident individual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> His science was really fascinating. Uh, and he was undoubtedly the best candidate with respect to like research program and productivity and all those different things. Um, but he eventually, so he, he did actually come to the University of Tennessee. Um, and then he proceeded to uh, take philosophy classes and earned a doctorate in philosophy while he was there. Uh, and then left for New York, uh, I think it, uh, one of the universities in New York, and as a philosophy professor. Uh, anyway, okay, tangent over. Um, all organisms share common descent and are adapted to the environment through natural selection. I think it's kind of obvious this is Piccolucci's statement because it uses the word share common descent. Uh, no young earth creationist is going to say that all organisms share common descent. There's no universal common descent in, in, in creationism. So it, it, Guglielmo never would have said that in the past. Uh, so that first statement is, is uh, Piccolucci's. But his, Guglielmo's statement is, point is still made here. Every organism descends from ancestors. Okay. Right, every organism alive today has is the descendant of a prior ancestor, right? I don't know of any organism today on Earth that God snapped his fingers and made, like right now. And the natural select and natural selection has acted upon ancestral variation, variation that existed in the ancestors, and de novo mutations, brand new mutations, variants that appear in populations that didn't exist when from God's initial creation to adapt them to changing environments. Gullios is right in the sense that, yes, that just sounds like evolutionary biology. Those are evolutionary mechanisms for adapting and changing organisms. And Gullios just can't handle that there could be a component of evolutionary theory that uh, might fit within a young earth creationist world. Now, of course, I've been emphasizing that young earth creationists are, are really, they all are young earth evolutionists. Now, I have a particular meaning of that. I don't mean that they believe in universal common descent. I just mean that they accept a large amount of change over time. The amount of speciation that they accept is tantamount to uh, broad scale macroevolution by any um, conventional evolutionary uh, thought. The thoughts these statements share are no foresight, random broken genes, gradual change, in active environments adapting passive organisms, adapt to them, acted upon by Darwinian selection, and no hint of design purposeful process. Statement one is Pigalucci's, therefore the statement that creationists have the same data but have different interpretations isn't really true in this case. Now I think Guglielmo is actually making some cogent arguments here. If his argument, if if you want to say that young earth creationists are co-opting the same mechanisms to explain how organ how species change and how species adapt to their environments, I just don't understand. I guess I kind of do understand what he's saying here, but um, I, I'm going to agree with other young earth creationists that Gulliu is, is, is just wrong and that his mechanism actually won't accomplish what he thinks it's going to accomplish. Uh, at the end of the day, if you get down in the details, the problem is there are no details. Um, it's a lot of talk and not actual evidence of, you know, not poning up the evidence that it actually happens. Uh, don't play Darwin's game. We need to develop a new theory. Okay, now you get into the engineering talk. Everyone knows that engineers don't produce designs in a purposeless, chaotic fashion, right? We wouldn't use random chance 
and natural selection, although lots of, well, I guess engineers don't use natural selection so much, but natural selection has become a fairly useful technique in molecular biology, especially uh, medicine. But if the st status of true science is retained for the evolutionary scenario that randomness and mistakes truly can cobble together living things, then people will continually be persuaded away from accepting that creatures originated from a supernatural engineer called God. See, he's worried that if you continue to use these naturalistic processes, that somehow that's going to move God out of the picture. This isn't really any different than um, what people have argued for a thousand years. That every time somebody comes up with some explanation for how something works that people used to just ascribe to God, that somehow that eliminates God from the equation. And he's worried there's you're going to get eliminated even more here. Creation scientists have been doing a disservice to fellow believers. We've been teaching that Darwinian mutation selection mechanism is real, but just limited in effect. And the evolutionist error is claiming that its effect is nearly unlimited. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's identifying what young earth creationists are doing. Yeah, we'll, we'll take all these major mechanisms of how organisms adapt and change, and we'll just say that they only apply in these particular circumstances and they don't apply else, they don't apply to deeper relationships or deeper ancestry. And he would be right if he went on to continue and say something that I've said many times, which is it's once you've taken that approach, it's really hard to identify how you would stop that change from actually explaining deeper ancestry. How would you stop natural selection and mutation from making one kind change into another? I haven't heard a young earth evolution. <laughs> I just said it, young earth evolutionist. I haven't heard a young earth creationist come up with a good explanation for how they would, how that process is stopped, how it's limited. This has been a colossal mistake. The evidence from the mouths of evolutionary theorists is that key assumptions epitomized and the mutation selection itself are the segue to anti-design and thus are anti-theistic assumptions. The gloves are off. Right? He is calling out Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, and really all young earth evolutionists, which, by the way, ICR has written about young earth evolutionists in the past. They did it before Ken Ham did. Really, all young earth creationists are wrong, except for this exclusive club at the Institute for Creation Research and maybe a few other people that, that find some commonality with them. At ICR, we greatly regret ever having endorsed the mutation selection mechanism. When you stop to think about it, the whole notion of a chaotic mechanism for adaption is inconsistent with all the, uh, all the other incredible complex and purposeful biological systems the Lord Jesus created. Now, what I'm waiting for from Guglielsa and others there is an explanation for, okay, organisms are replicating themselves, reproducing. Uh, they clearly are adding new mutations to the next generation. Now, if he wants to say they're not random, he needs to explain how they come to be and how is God directing those mutations. Let's, let's see some uh, research done uh, looking at patterns of mutations and how each one has, has a specific purpose. In other words, I want to I wanna know, I want him to explore the mechanisms of how God is actively directing things. I know that's an extremely challenging uh, challenge, but um, he's probably going to have to start using words that sound just like the words that evolutionary creationists and young earth creationists use to explain God's action in this world in this present age. How does God, if, how does God actually, actually do his, uh, accomplish his purposes, right, through secondary means? Because once you start talking about secondary means, you're going to start talking about natural processes. And if you just use natural process language, then you are doing what he's saying here, which is, uh, where was that now? You are doing anti-design and anti. you have anti-theistic assumptions if you're not using theistic words. This is going to come down to semantics, really. Um, okay, we regret ever having endorsed mutation selection and mechanism. Uh, we compromised creationist thinking with Darwin's death-driven worldview. 
by using the phrase for this fallen world as our own segue to accommodate the misery associated with mutation selection. He's saying, we, you know, creationists often say, well, we're in a fallen world, so things are falling apart, and that's causing changes to happen and it can't be avoided. All right, I, I guess what's, what's the alternative then? That, uh, that the world isn't decaying, it isn't breaking down, or that the breakdown is, is in a designed way, like every single thing is like um, coordinated in order to cause these changes. Um, I'm willing to entertain that thought uh, in terms of a uh, discussion about sovereignty and free will and all that other stuff. Um, so I th that would, I'd love to see Gulia talk about it in that sense. But just to leave it as, hey, you, you're saying um, that these things are random. We're not saying that, but we're not actually going to say how it actually happens or, or what the alternative is. Okay, what else did I want to cover here? This is this going on a long time, so i got to... I got to wrap this up because I wanted to say something about Ken Ham too. Okay, let's get down here. This is why ICR's continuous environmental tracking model of adaption is so liberating. It's the first engineering-based organism-focused model that interprets altered genetic sequences as purposeful modifications and not broken genes. So a pseudogene, a gene that doesn't function anymore, is actually a purposeful modification. That mutation, that thing that happened, broke that gene, except it's not broke. It caused it to become non-functional, which actually uh, helped the organism do something, and therefore it has purpose. So you're just, you're just labeling everything as having purpose. Um, but if you asked what the underlying mechanism that broke the gene was, I think you're going to start using terms that are going to sound an awful like what you're complaining other people are doing. They're regulating changes rather than random mutations. It views such sequences as being targeted for intentionally bringing about rapid and predictable adaptations in order to solve specific environmental changes. You can, he can predict where the mutations are going to occur and what they're going to do. ICR's experiments on blind cavefish. Now here I'm saying they haven't done any experiments, but uh, yeah, wait till we see those experiments on blind cavefish. Are confirming our pro-design assumptions. We'll, we'll look at those some other time. Perceptive evolutionists know that the true victory resides in people embracing their anti-design mechanisms. Once everyone is playing their anti-design game and their anti-design field by their anti-design rules, then we've already won and they've lost. No matter how many caveats or disclaimers we attach. Playing Darwin's game only pits creationists against evolutionists in a highly subjective squabble over what mutation selection can accomplish. Yeah, it's true. I've spent a lot of time talking about how Young Earth creationists are think that mutation selection can accomplish certain things, and I don't think that there's any experimental evidence that shows that it can accomplish what they claim it can accomplish in terms of the rate of speciation and the types of adaptations that have occurred. And so Gulios is right in the sense. And without them, even considering whether it's true or dishonors the Lord Jesus, creationists have an opportunity to provide a pro-design and far more Christ-honoring and scientifically accurate explanation for biological change if we'll just pursue it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. This is, uh, this is uh, laying it down for us here. Okay, so that is uh, mutation selection, a calamitous, a calamitous creationist concession that's been made. And who's making that concession? Answers in Genesis, Creation Ministries International, most creation scientists are making this calamitous, uh, you know, acceptance. Well, that brings us back. Hmm. That brings us back to Ken Ham because he's continuing this series on young earth evolution. And so in that particular series, um, he has stopped the series for now. I think there's been six episodes, six Fridays. Uh, and he has stopped, actually, I think five articles in an introduction. And he is pausing for a leaven warning. Pausing for a leaven warning. Apparently, he's gotten a lot of pushback. All right. He's heard a lot of complaints about this particular series uh, from his followers. And so he felt like he needed to um, pause the series, but he claims it is definitely going forward. 
uh, and they're only halfway through. So we've got another four or five articles to come. I can guess what at least two of them will be. Definitely one on walking whales. Uh, so let's look just a little bit at uh, what Ken Ham's thinking here is. He's going to try to reset the stage again and remind people of why this is important and reaffirm that he's not going to change, right? You know, he's heard a lot of complaints, but he's not going to change. So here we go. Uh, recently, staff, several research staff, writers, reviewers, and editors for Answers in Genesis have been producing a series on articles that we call Young Earth Evolution, or YEE. We are currently midway through this series, so they're only halfway through, which is being produced by a number of staff because of an extremely sincere burden we at Answers in Genesis have in upholding the absolute authority of God's word. These articles are written to warn others that once a door to undermine the authority is cracked open, it can lead to an eventual domino effect. In other words, a small error can result in a major issue over time. Sounds very much like what Guglielmo was just talking about, right? We actually let it this crack in, and we're, we're going we're to stop it up now. Um, while the series has been running, we have received quite a few emotional negative responses. Not rational negative responses, emotional re responses, negative responses, with accusations of ad hominem attacks by our authors. Some have claimed that they're being produced by a single author, which is not the case. These are ministry statements. Now, the statement right here, some have claimed they're being produced by a single author, which is not the case. That would be me. I, I mean, he's clearly talking about me because I have, I have insinuated or suggested that all these articles are produced by one author. Now, I didn't mean that every word of all those articles are, are written by one author. Clearly, Georgia Purdom has one of those articles, and the, the, the uh, preamble to that article, I think, was written by uh, another person, I mean, not Georgia Purdom. Uh, and there are elements of some of the other papers that I, other articles that I think have been edited. And so it is a, it is a group effort, but I think there is one person behind most of them. All right. That would be Harry F. Sanders. And we know that Harry F. Sanders wrote the first article because it was published under Harry F. Sanders III's name when the very first article came out. Right. They removed that later and said it was a ministry statement. But nonetheless, Harry F. Sanders has written many other articles for Answers in Genesis and his name was on the first one. And if you were to do some kind of word analysis and look at the, the structure of how that was, well, actually just look at the ideas in that, you'll very clearly see that it is a Harry F. Sanders article if you've read other Harry F. Sanders articles uh, uh, at Answers in Genesis. Uh, and most of the other elements of the other articles also are part and parcel of things that he has said, you know, he or she, it's a suit on him, right? Um, and so it's, it's not unfair to say that the series of articles look like they are the brainchild in terms of the original writing of one person. And sure, they've been discussed and possibly massaged somewhat by others, and so they are a, a team effort. But at their core, they're written by uh, one primary individual. These responses remind me of what happens a few years ago at Answers in Genesis decided a particular shape for the life size arc. And then he goes on and talks about how like in the past we've received complaints and, you know, basically we got we got past those. People just, you know, don't like something different and so they complain. Uh, but then he's going to go on and say that like, we earnestly, uh, now I earnestly believe after checking things with others, taking counsel in the wisdom of many, and spending considerable time in discussion with our researchers, the answers Genesis, that we have found something that we call young earth evolution. These young earth evolution ideas where creationists have accepted some false evolutionary assumptions that have led them to believe, uh, led to what we believe is error in a number of areas that we believe and teach. Now, Randy Gugliosa is saying the exact same thing, and he's saying that Ken Ham is in error. Right. That he the things that his group of researchers that are writing these articles, the things that they believe and say regularly in their articles are errors that need to be corrected by by uh, by creationists. So this current series of articles on young earth evolution has an overarching theme of responding to instances 
in which we believe some creationist researchers have, for unknown reasons, accepted various secular evolutionary assumptions unnecessarily. We believe this is opening the door to undermining biblical authority and could lead to others accepting more evolutionary assumptions and eventually giving up biblical authority. Now, if our assertion is correct, this will be a very serious issue, and so we need to take it very seriously indeed. And then he points out, here are some of the main things that they're concerned about. And he's going to summarize, here are the main points. Here are the main things that we see creeping in. And these reflect some of the points already made in previous articles, but also it's obvious that there are points that are going to be made in future articles. Some creationists have accepted the idea that some dinosaurs had feathers. Please go back and watch my video. There are other people who have written video uh, that have had videos that have discussed uh, their article about dinosaurs and feathers. This is a ridiculous argument to be making against other young earth creationists. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't have time here to go over all that, but I think this is just, this is silly. Certain creationists are using the term evolution in a way that can cause people to think secular evolutionists are correct in saying that the evidence supports molecules to man evolution. That goes back to what I said about Guliuza not liking to use the terms mutation and natural selection. But ultimately, even in his explanations, even if he comes up with different words, he's using some of the same concepts. Um, and this is just also the idea of like, kowtowing to your to your audience and like saying my audience is really dumb they don't understand the nuances of different forms of types of evolution and different extents of evolution so therefore we shouldn't be using those words and these other young earth evolutionists are using those words and confusing people but they're being they're not actually believing anything really different than you are so it it's uh, it's all pretty frustrating there are creationists who accept the order of the fossils in the geological record as being the order in which certain creatures came into existence. These have great implications on how to interpret the fossil record. And I think we're going to have that coming up because they haven't really discussed that yet. And I'll be very interested to see what they have to say about this whole ordering in the fossil record thing and how that could be a problem. Some creationist researchers use the term evidence to imply that the supposed evidence found in nature supports evolution. In other words, some people say there is evidence for evolution. We don't believe that evolution is, is true, but we can understand how there is evidence that points in that particular direction. We don't even want to even say that because it's not possible since it is false. Um, all right. And then the whole ambiguous thing, ambiguous thing, which was the latest article. Is it a private issue? Should we have gone to these folks? No, they're talking publicly about their idea, so therefore we can speak publicly and we can call them out publicly. Uh, I think that they are, I don't think they've done enough to address those young earth evolutionists personally, um, that they haven't, I think they should confront them more privately before coming out this publicly, but um, I'm not, I'm not a, a big stickler on that. Uh, idea because after it is all public stuff people have published in different areas and made their made their views known the challenge let us hold scripture in high regard so here's my challenge to everybody consider carefully what our staff and researchers have written and check it out diligently yes we encourage our readers to be berean with what they read from us as well and yes we can have a back and forth arguments but let us not just react negatively because our favorite researchers are being challenged concerning something they are teaching let us hold scripture in high regard, right? Don't get upset if we're calling other people out because we're doing it for the right reasons because we're upholding the, the authority of God. It's a, the, the authority of scripture is like this club that's used. We hold up the authority of scripture and therefore it's like, well, we must, you know, we're right because we're obviously the ones on the right side. <laughs> So that's Ken Ham's, that's not his response to Guliosa because Guliosa's article comes out later, but there are many similarities between the approach that Answers in Genesis is having toward other young earth creationists than what ICR is having. So here we have two really significant rifts that are occurring. Uh, divides are forming in, in really, I think, very surprising ways in young earth creationists. And what it's, what it's about is, um, I mean, there's lots of other things that divide young earth creationists, like the flood boundary itself divides creationists. But um, this is interesting because it's almost like it's a multi-layered thing. We've got 
we have um, Answers in Genesis, we have Institute for Creation Research, and we have Young Earth Evolutionist. And uh, Answers in Genesis, with respect to answer to ICR, is actually part of the Young Earth Evolutionist in a way. Actually, not in a way. I think they are Young Earth Evolutionist by the definition that ICR has. I will should go back to that article that ICR wrote, and we'll, we'll see how much ICR, I mean, sorry, AIJ fits into their definition of a young earth evolutionist. But then you have Answers in Genesis who thinks they're the ones that are upholding the real truth and are opposed to this young earth evolution, and it's others that are young earth evolutionist. Wow. So if you really are a young earth evolutionist, according to Answers in Genesis, you're caught behind the ire, you know, in, in the sights of both ICR and AIG at the same time. That's a tough spot to be. Okay, I have one other item, and thank goodness I'm about out of time because I've already recorded a one and a half hour video on this, but it, I, it will never be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, it was far too rambly, and I went off into a whole bunch of different tangents uh, and I kind of like vetted for myself on, on, on a topic. And the topic it has to do with the picture in your screen here, which is essentially um, an image of a worship service, right? With strobe lights and you can't see it up there, but you know, some kind of rock band or something like that, right? So this is a, an entertainment venue, essentially. And Kenny Ham and I have similar thoughts uh, about the purpose of singing the necessity of the preaching of the word um, and just the type and style of worship that is most honoring to God. Um, and we also have similar thoughts, shockingly, that are, I, I think, well, I mean, I guess I should say it for Ham and not for me. Um, I think Ham's views here are, are relatively nuanced. It's not simply, I'm an old guy and I grew up on hymns and they're the best. And um, you know, these young kids think they know what's best, but they don't. And I don't say that either. I mean, I appreciate a lot of worship songs and I think there are some good ones. And I also am, you know, I can tolerate a praise band or a worship band and a worship leader. Uh, I think it can be done very well. And I think it can be done in the right spirit. Um, but there are certain, there are certain styles of music and approaches to music and certain approaches, I guess, to what the purpose of worship is and how people should worship God, um, that praise bands and rock bands, um, although it's possible to, to honor God in appropriate fashion, have your heart in the right place, the temptations are so great to make it something about ego and performance that it's probably not worth the dangers, right? There's too many dangers along that line to make up for the, the benefits of it. Uh, and I think that's kind of the bottom line uh, for, for Ken Ham, right? It's, it's like too much devotion is paid to this aspect of worship when it is the preaching of the word that is the most effectual thing and the most important part of a worship service. So if the praise team and the worship team, you know, become too dominant, you know, and essentially run the service, and the preaching of the word is, and the and and prayer as well, are subsumed underneath sort of the atmosphere of the worship band, the the, the praise service, and sometimes the, the the lack of gravitas that comes with it. Um, that that overall is not something that is attractive, right? It's not something that is pushing. Well, I shouldn't say pushing the church forward something that is edifying in this day and age when people really need substance. Um, and so that's, a, I think, a growing problem within the church. And see, and see Ken Ham goes to a, a lot of churches to speak, and a lot of them are going to be Baptists and various evangelical churches. And there's a strong move toward this form of worship service uh, in those circles. And that's kind of you know, for him juxtaposed, you know, to what he really likes to talk about a lot, which is the authority of scripture, right? And see, I do have uh, a kinship with Ken Ham with respect to the importance of the authority of scripture. We just have a disagreement about uh, 
about a particular area of scripture and its interpretation, right? And the fact that my interpretation doesn't uh, undermine the authority of God like Ken Ham believes that it undermines. All right, I said we got to keep it short because I'm going too long. So I'll just read the first part. On the topic that often stirs up emotional reactions and greatly varied opinions concerns music in churches. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm more scared talking about this topic than I am any area of origins research. All right. Young Earth creationism, intelligent design, evolutionary biology. Um, that's easy stuff compared to what worship style do you use in your church and why? Um, do I even want to go there? Yeah. Do I even want to go there? Why am I doing this at all to myself right now? Well, I thought I would give it a try. Yeah, I guess I'm giving it a try too, but I'm not going to go very far with it. Um, so he talks about how we should be praising and we should be having, you know, we should be singing psalms, hymns, and scriptural songs, right? We should be making uh, a melody to the Lord. Um, but his fundamental point at the end is that uh, he sees that songs are really geared toward performance. And we should be, we, the kind of, what is up front should be leading us in our singing so that we can sing out. Um, and that's the beauty of, a, you know, there's nothing biblical about like thou shalt have a piano or thou shalt only have a piano or thou shalt not have guitars. Um, that's not the underlying principle, right? The thing is, we need to be worshiping God through our song, uh, and it should be emanating from us to God rather than us watching, all right, performance. And see, the thing is, I don't, I don't want to be too critical here because performance, like a choir, you can be listening to the words, taking them in, and in a way you are echoing those words, right? And that's a form of, of praise. Um, and you could be watching a performance and you feel like you're participating, although it's often an emotional response, but you're participating in that. Maybe you're hearing the words and you are reflecting those and you can do that. Uh, the problem is it's just a lot of worship songs and band songs and so forth just don't have the depth that a lot of other songs that we, we would sing. And it gives us an excuse not to sing. And we become passive. And that's the part of it that is like, that's the portion of a service where you're, you're not passive. You know, if you're actively uh, singing, that's something you're actively thinking and doing. Uh, and that kind of action is important. I think it was as, as an instructor, it's really important for me to get students to actively participate in discussing a problem or something like that, not just I'm the lecturer and you just listen to me uh, the whole time. Of course, you can learn that way, but it's not the best way to learn. And I think what Ken Ham's saying is not that he's pinpointing any one thing is like, that's evil and you can't do that. So I think in this way, I want to give him some credit for being not black and white and just saying, thou shalt do that. This is what's good. This is exactly what the Bible demands. And then everything else is evil. He's saying all these things are acceptable if done in the right heart and the right mind, the right frame of mind. But there are certain ways and styles of doing things that have become, uh, we, we have succumbed to the culture of the day and said, we're going to do what we think makes people happy rather than giving them what they need. And I think of that too as an educator, you know, as a college student comes in, are we just teaching them what they want to hear? And okay, all right. Oh yeah. Oh, that was too hard. I, 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 oh, that's what you want. Or we say like, this is what I need to prepare you for. And so I'm gonna tell you what you need to know, not you tell me what you need to know and want to know. Um, all right, so I'm starting to ramble on this topic and if, I'm afraid that if I continue, I will say way too much. So I'm gonna stop there. I just wanted to point out that uh, I actually agree with Ken Ham on something. All right, that's it for me. That's This Week in Creationism. Uh, subscribe, like, uh, hang out uh, on my YouTube channel. Lots of other content there. And we've got a whole bunch of other things to talk about. I haven't even got to talk about Nathaniel Jensen. Uh, we've got two other articles about young earth evolutionists we need to get to. So there's a ton of stuff to do in the next episode of This Week in Creationism. So come back for more. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.